gang, we have some exciting news. Uh, they've just done an FAQ for the end of May saying there's going to be some rule changes of Butterball and uh, some of them I am very interested in because as those of you who follow me regularly will know, I have a serious loathing of um, playing against Underworld at tournaments um, and I am very much responsible for causing people other people to feel the same way because I played Underworld a lot before fully getting to understand how busted they've been but the new word is that Underworld are going to lose swarming so I uh, am really excited to hear that they are going to be coming down a peg let's read the FAQ together and see what it says so Blood Bowl FAQ Bombers Bloodlust and Blocking I don't know what the Bombers one's going to be. That's interesting too. Don't interrupt, Tree, even if you are a robotic voice from the void. It's rude. Thank you, Shambo. Uh, greetings, sports fans. It's May, and that means the Blood Bowl design team is ready to provide the first of their biannual FAQ updates. We caught up with Blood Bowl rules writer and chief herald of Nuffle, Jay, to see what balance updates have been implemented this time around. Jay, over the past months, we've been keeping a close eye on the state of Blood Bowl, looking at tournament results, win percentages, and the questions sent into our FAQ inbox. We've answered some of the more burning questions, as well as taking the opportunity to rebalance the game in a few ways. We can interrupt Tree now. Awesome. <laughs> a process we explain here. Underworld Denizens. It's fair to say Underworld Denizen teams have been dominating for some time now, so we have opted to rebalance them slightly and bring them in line with the rest of the teams. As a result, we've removed the swarming trait from the Underworld's Notlings, meaning they can no longer flood the pitch and overwhelm their opponents. Decisions like this are never taken lightly, and we are confident this change will help to rein in the Underworld Denizens team slightly while still allowing them to compete. So I think this is a great change. Um, as you've all just been hearing me say, I, I think Underworld have been a really oppressively not fun team in tabletop tournaments recently. Uh, it took perhaps a minute of everyone to work out the meta, but they are so well costed or so generously costed that the ability to have basically always a 16 player roster. You Don't can do interrupt, Ferret, <laughs> I will ban you. a 16 player roster that often gets star players. So they can really easily, even with 16 players, they can often price in Ripper or Varag Um bit harder to price in Morg most of the time, but sometimes they can even get in Morg. Or they can not go down the star player route, do what I did at the World Cup, where um, I just took two bribes and a keg and just be a team that fouls and fouls and fouls. Um, I believe I'm still ranked as the number one underworld coach in the UK, which is pretty much just because I had the World Cup and the tournament leading up to it, where I basically worked out oh wait what if I just do this with a fouling and um it, it was hideously effective like hideously effective um I didn't have a good time doing it um especially I've talked about on stream before at the world cup I had a game where I'd pitch cleared a Norse team by turn seven and that was a good coach to someone who was quite well ranked and it was like well this could have been an interesting game but it's not because we've just taken your team away I, I think it's been a really oppressively, like I said, a good team. I've had some really frustrating experiences since stopping doing that. I made a choice. I'm not going to play this team anymore. But then I keep running into them with my wood elves and finding myself on the other side of that where you just feel like very quickly you have no chance because the numbers game is so unbalanced. Playing against 13 or 14 players on the pitch, which might include one of the best star players in the game when your team is very quickly down to seven or eight players because of the fouling it, it feels really unbalanced and unfun so I'm super glad they've made this change I personally think that team will still be quite competitive but it will definitely change um, it'll definitely change how they play and that's a good thing um I thought we're supposed to interrupt Ferret. Always interrupt Ferret. Don't interrupt me. Uh, a humble brag top underworld. Yeah, gotta throw that in there. Can't not mention it, Shambo. Um, did I burn the underworld models? No, the thing is, actually, honestly, like, all jokes aside, 
once I'd got to that point with Underworld where I was annoyed about it and didn't want to play them anymore, it like really bummed me out because I think all Underworld were quite fun. All Underworld were this not great team that, yes, did also rely on that fouling game and sometimes that could be swingy. But it always felt like you were sort of punching uphill so it wasn't unfair. Whatever you got, it was what you could try to get. I had a really fun Blood Bowl 2 run with the old Underworld where we took them to, to playoffs and, and and had a real go of it. But it always felt like, well, you're the underdog. So you're you're fighting for everything you get. And and I have some minis for them because I went to the previous World Cup and that was the commemorative team they gave you as you could get that team as the World Cup team. And they're really fun minis. They were painted really beautifully by a friend of mine. So I, I enjoy bringing them to the tabletop. And when the team stopped being fun to play, that really made me a bit sad, actually, because I have these great minis that I like and I can't use them. So I'm really encouraged that they might be more fun to bring my minis in and not have burned them, like Lionel said. So I think that's a great change. I still think they're a good team. You can still build really cost-effective rosters. You still have half price bribes, which... I always have felt like, well, why should they get half price bribes? That's a goblin team thing because justice for goblins who are like the worst team in the game now. But I think that swarming will bring them down like a peg without destroying them. So big fan of that change on the underworld denizens. Uh, garden fouling. One thing that's become apparent is the constant growth of fouling meta where coaches are prioritizing fouling the opposition off the pitch. This is becoming increasingly prevalent, so we've decided to lessen the impact slightly. Before, players with the guard skill would be able to provide offensive and defensive assistance to foul actions, making it easier to stick the boot in. In this update, we've changed this so guard now only provides assists to block actions instead. That's just a rollback to the rules as they were in... Oh my god, speaking of justice for goblins, I've just read right ahead. I'll have to hold up, hold up, sorry. Um... Guard only provides this to block actions instead. This is a rollback to the rules as they were before the 2020 rules that was introduced. I don't think there is anyone in the game who thought that guard was an underpowered skill in the old rules. So I think this is not something that anyone's going to be mad about, right? Like you're still going to take guard. Guard is still great. It's It's still one of the best skills in the whole game. Maybe even I sometimes think the best one because I always think a team with all block is good. But if you were offered a team with all guard, you might say that's even better. So block's probably still the best, but guard is one of those skills that is so good it's even. You could have a discussion about guard and block. So guard is a great skill. It didn't need to help on fouls. And I think this is also really good for tournament play, for just breaking some of the really no fun builds like teams would have guard and then they would take dribble and draw and dribble and draw can give you dp plus two fouling and between those two things that's just really miserably hard to get away from just being fouled out and so i think that's just again a decision that i think is great and i'm all for removing guards this is huge yeah i think it's i think it's good did i say slightly sorry <laughs> I undersold it. Um, Goblin Bombers. This I'm super excited about. This genuinely is going to cause me to take goblins to tournaments more, I think, because bombers with pass are hilarious. Uh, Goblin Bombers. One of the smaller changes to Goblin Bombers who've gained access to passing skills on a primary instead of a secondary. That brings them in line with the Snotling Fungus Flingers and makes them more adept at chucking their iconic bombs. Goblin Coaches. Rejoice. I am, um, I have a real soft spot for goblins. They're just a team that I loved a lot in Blood Bowl 2 and so the old edition of the rules. And uh, I don't know why of all the stunty teams, I'm excited to try gnomes, so I might come around to gnomes. But goblins were always the stunty team that I felt like were my stunty team, the one that I felt an affinity to. I just find the, the silliness of the weapons fun. Uh, so I think this seems like it's going to be such a tiny buff to them because the team is still just generally not very good. And I think it's 
a little thing that will make goblins feel a lot less um, hard done by maybe compared to some of the other Sunday teams that have been given so many perks. Because um, I did spend a secondary skill at a sevens tournament recently to give my bomber a pass and it was great. So small upgrade, but I like it. Uh, bloodlust clarifications. We've also taken the opportunity to clarify a number of interactions with the bloodlust X plus trait. Does a player have to take bloodlust if they begin their activation prone? What happens if a stunned player is stunned again by being bitten? And how does bloodlust interact with foul appearance or have been tackled in this FAQ? So I don't know what they've actually done here. This is just uh, something I'm going to have to read the actual FAQ for. If anyone knows and wants to say in chat, please do. Um, gnomes, the newest team to stroll onto the pitches across the Bud Bowl world. Gnomes have caused quite a stir across community. There has been some small confusion regarding the trickster traits, so we provided some clarifications to help. Also, as we mentioned in the Gnome Reveal blog, we've amended the Halfling Master Chef so that the discounted rates only apply to Halfling teams. That, I think, we all knew was coming. I don't know what the issue with trickster would be. Um, so, again, if anyone knows that and wants to tell me, that would be great. Um... Removing goddess, this is huge. Essential for ladder for sure. High TV matchups you can't defend against fouls. Yeah, very true, Crystal Hunter. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Crystal. Stuck behind ads. I'm sorry. Um, my favorite question is, can a movement two player rush for two plus to get the extra point of movement instead of having to roll a four plus for stand? The answer is no. <laughs> Sham, Sarferet, you're just picking the thing to upset me because it affects trees. You're a bully and you tricked me into saying that. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Halfling Master Chef thing we all knew about. I think there were just some people. I don't know if anyone here, I'm sure some people here spend time sometimes on the Blood Bowl community page. The Blood Bowl community page has lots of good stuff on it, but you do get some people who you feel like are just trying to break the rules for the sake of breaking them. And there were people asking on the Blood Bowl community page, but saying, oh, well, this, even though it's in, even though they've said about the Master Chef in such and such uh, explanation about gnomes, it's not in an official rules document yet. So I think I should be allowed to take the half price. The, the, the cheap master chef some people some people just like to be difficult um so i think that's one of those clarifications that had been said but still needed to be said a little bit more clearly <laughs> rules is written chicken says black hawks are a bit worse with the garden earth to be honest with you yes i think black hawks are the one team who might feel as a team that already isn't amazing I think Blackhawks maybe are the one team who did want that gardener for fouling. The guard, the guard buff story for fouling. So yeah, I guess Blackhawks who already weren't great have suffered a bit, which is a shame, but. OWA as well. The problem with this is I don't know if I want to, oh, hang on. So it's just the things in pink. We can see the new things. So, if a player is bitten by a vampire as a result of failed bloodlust roll and becomes stunned, even if already stunned, do they roll over and become prone at the end of the turn? Excuse me. Do they roll over and become prone at the end of the turn in which they are stunned, or the following turn at the end of the following turn? This seems like how I would have played it anyway. Um, but I guess that's just clarifying for people who aren't sure. Um, can a player with movement two or less attempt to rush to stand up instead of just rolling a four plus stand up? No. Again, I think we knew this. It's sad, obviously. I would love for trees to be able to not have to roll a four plus to stand up, but that's just the rule. Uh, can the pro skill be used to re roll the dice when a player attempts to stand up? No, that one I might not have been aware of. Um, so that's interesting. Um, The stun to choose going back on the previous FAQ. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so that's flipped that. 
Yeah, you cannot use skills while prone. That makes sense. If a player uses the ball and chain move special action and moves out of the tackle zone of a player with the tentacle skill, does the player with tentacles get to use the skill? No. If a player uses ball and chain and... Okay, so tentacles doesn't hold the ball and chain. I think that's a good thing. I think ball and chains should be allowed to do their ball and chain thing. Um, yeah. If a player with fumble risky begins their activation without the ball, then picks it up during their activation. Oh my god. This is going to make my head spin. If a player with the fumble risky skill begins their activation without the ball, Oh, okay. So can you pick it up and fumble Ruski in the same turn? That wasn't actually that complicated. Uh, yes, I just confused myself. Um, okay. Is that it? Okay, there's more bloodlust stuff down here. If a player with bloodlust begins their activation prone, do they still need to roll for bloodlust? Yes. If a player with bloodlust fails the roll for bloodlust, can they continue to move? After biting a thrall in order to score, make a pass action or reposition. No. After a model has bitten a thrall, they may move no further unless they have a rule that specifically states otherwise, such as running pass. Oh my goodness. There's an interaction that you're almost certainly never going to see, but will can make things more confusing. Yes, Magiot says confused about that one. Um, so normally when you bite a thrall, with bloodlust, that is the end of your movement. Um, so normally if you were throwing a pass with a vampire who'd bloodlusted, you'd move next to the thrall, bite them, and then throw the pass. But what they're saying here is that if you have running pass, you could run up to a thrall, bite it, then move, then presumably pass, and then move again. Because running pass is you can keep moving until you've even after you've done the pass or is it saying that at the point is it saying that at the point when you do the bite you do the throw and then you can move afterwards i guess i guess that's how that would work the pass is not before the bite i don't think i thought the i thought the bite always had to come before the action yeah i think the bite happens before the pass yeah yeah, yeah. Because you don't get to pass if you can't bite. This is... So, like, I think I've understood this, right? So this means that your player with, run, your player with running pass has run up to someone and bitten them. And then you could pass and then you could move. The thing I don't know is, could you run up to someone, bite, move past move but i think we're really getting into the reads here so i think the point is that you could i think you would do the bite do the pass and then you'd have your movement left i think mm. no i think they're saying you pass bite and then move no you bite pass then move I, we're confusing ourselves now <laughs> i'm confusing myself i think this is f roll to one on bloodlust Move next to your thrall, bite the thrall, throw the pass, finish your movement with a running pass. I think that's all that means. And I think anything else is overcomplicating it. What happens when a player with a bloodlust trait targets a player with a foul appearance skill and fails both the bloodlust and the foul appearance? The player must first take the bloodlust roll. If this is failed, they may choose to change their declared action to a move action. We knew this in which case they will not need to roll foul appearance. If they do not, they will need to roll foul appearance as normal. If it's failed, then their action is wasted and their activation will end. This will result in a turnover if they can't bite an adjacent teammate. That all makes sense to me. That's just saying, yeah, once you fail the bloodlust, if you then fail, fail foul appearance and you have no one to bite, then that's the turnover. Uh, gnomes, uh, when a player uses a trickster trait, does the player being removed from the pitch then placed again count as a player moving? No, it's a placement, not movement. As such, any rules that interact with the player moving, such as shadowing or tentacles. Oh, so you can't hold the trigger to with tentacles. That's interesting. Um, 
that is interesting. I've not really played with or against gnomes yet. I've just watched people playing them, so I didn't I didn't know the wording of that. Um, if a player uses a trickster trait and places themselves in a square containing the board, they attempt to pick it up. No, it is a placement, not a movement. As such, the ball will... Now that's genuinely going to create some weird situations. So you can't trickster into a free pickup, but you can trickster to scatter. So that one is... That one is... Uh, it's potentially interesting. So we're still on the running pass one for Magiot. Magiot, I don't think it does override Bloodlust. So you fail Bloodlust. That means you have to bite. So you move next to the player and then you bite. And then... Oh, so what you're saying is Bloodlust would mean that you then stop. So yeah, that they're adding that as an exception, I guess, to the rule. That running pass would still let you keep moving. I guess, yeah, the way Conan said it there, it's an exception. What? Any other questions that I've missed while reading this? You could read that FAQ as meaning that if you end in the TV zone with a ball, you don't score even if you pitch the roll. Could you? I'm not sure I agree with that. Um... Funnily, I was telling myself, does the question impact dwarfs? If yes, then the answer should be no. And then you ask, well, okay, that's Lady Le is replying to someone. I'm not sure what, so it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, chicken, will Dark Elves just be the top new meta team now? Will Underworld without Swarming just be a weaker version of Skaven? Or still good as a deep bench and can still use snotlings and all the toys? Didn't hear a tree cover that bit. Um, personally, my hunch is that Underworld will still be competitive. I think they will not be as competitive, but I think because of the cheapness of the team, if you have a rule set that allows star players, they can still be very effective at using star players. And I think that um, they will still be very effective at using fouling, but they will they will not be the best team necessarily. They might, they might still be the best team, I don't know. I think they'll still be a competitive team, which is, um, I think that's fine. Because you're still talking about a team that's going to be super cheap, that's going to have a gutter runner with two heads in tournaments most of the time, or or at least can do. If it gets more than one skill, it can do all sorts of things, could take sidestep as well. That's going to have very good big guy, that's going to have a good blitzer with, with whatever skill you think is most necessary, tackle mighty bow, that's going to have a good fouling game, that's going to have good repositioning with the goblins. Probably you're just going to lean more into the goblins now than the snotlings, but you could still take snotlings if that saves you some cash to get good star players. Um, it's still nice to have a bench of, of several players. That means you're more insured against just getting bashed out. So there's still a team with a great one turn option with uh, great star player access with um, and not just a great one turn option, probably for, for tournament play, still the best one turn team in, in the game because you can still take a juggernaut ratoga and a two heads gutter runner which skaven rarely can do because they normally don't get the secondary access so it's still the best one turn team in the game um and you can still have snotlings on your roster to help fill squares for the one turn as well which is huge sometimes using those snotlings to fill gaps if your opponent is trying to be clever against you uh so they still have a really good out for, for winning games. They still have access to cheap bribes. They still have the star player access. I, I think they're still going to be really good, honestly. The more I think about it, they're just not going to be the most broken team. Um, But we'll see. I could be wrong. Yeah, like Chicken says, a lot of drives you only get one extra is not ring and they still seem competitive so I think they'll still be tier one JDYT I think they'll still be tier one in fact that's going to be a worry of mine now that a lot of tournament organizers are going to start under tiering them again because if you look at what Andy's done for his tournament before this rule was brought in he was going for making them tier zero 
So they had their own tier just for Underworld as a way to bring them back to the pack. So I think now they probably don't need their own tier, but they might, they would still be tier one, I think. I think. I think I think they're still going to be really competitive. I think people who who see this and think they're broke, they're, they're suddenly bad, are, are probably going to be either disappointed or happily surprised, depending on which way they're viewing that. Yeah, they will get worse on ladder, definitely, definitely. I'm not sure what Kalon's clapping back at there. I feel like that's maybe a misunderstanding going on. But hey, yeah, that was um that was the FAQ. I think overall I'm very happy with this FAQ. I think the swarming decision is just a good thing for the game. I think that they didn't need it underworld and I'm really pleased I'm really pleased about the way that the decision seems to have been made. Um the the text here from the um from the rules writer saying it's fair to say underworld denizens have been dominating for a long time. So that's actually engaging with the community who are saying, look, this team has been doing too well and, and needs to get brought back to the pack. So that's the reasoning behind it is really good as well. Um, so I, I think this is this is a thing that most people are going to be very happy about. I do understand Chris Lander's thoughts from a ladder perspective, but I, I'm not even convinced they're going to suddenly be bad in ladder. I think they might still be fine in ladder, just not as potentially good as they are now. I, I do think for the sake of fairness in Bud Bowl 3, they should let this season and, and this playoffs finish with them as they are, but I don't know how exactly that will work because once they implement changes in the game, presumably that will affect playoff games as well as regular season games. So if they try to bring it in for next season, that would automatically affect playoffs. So I actually don't know how they'll do that. That's a tricky question for the people who do Blood Bowl 3. Um, Garden Fouling, again, the only person who's given me a reason to dislike this change is Chicken. And that's just specifically saying that Black Orcs have a hard time already and this rule helps Black Orcs. So um, I I do feel sorry for Black Orcs with this change, but I still think it's good overall for Blood Bowl. I think this fouling, the fouling meta has been very dominant for a while and it's not always the most interesting meta. So I think this is a good thing. Um, and Guard is one of if not the best skill in the game even without this so it's definitely not too much of a nerf um goblin bombers have gained access to passing on a prime rate as a goblin coach i love this and i don't think that anyone has been going around thinking that goblins are overpowered so that is again just a definitely good decision in my opinion and then the rest of it is just clarifications. And I think more clarifications, more clarity is always a good thing. So, um, so yeah, that's how I feel about all of this. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, let me know how you feel about these changes. Do drop a comment below. And uh, while you're here, it would be lovely if you wanted to leave a like and subscribe as well.